basically what I want to do today, to talk about these approaches that people have used, and they actually did go all the way back to the beginnings of both histology and then electron microscopy, to deal with freezing samples and to freeze samples as one of the ways of, of preparing tissues in which there was less of a chance of artifacts due to chemical changes. So people were interested in it for quite a while. But as you'll see in a minute, there were some problems that came up when, when freezing samples and cutting samples. So that I'm going to talk a little bit about the cryostat, which is a machine for cutting frozen sections for use for the light microscope. And then we're going to look into the electron microscope parallels and look at the freeze fracture technique compared to freeze etching and get into some issues of how to interpret those kinds of images um, because they were technically a very interesting set of subjects. I want to talk about the cryostat as an instrument. So a cryostat in its simplest form is a freezer with a microtome in it, with a handle that lets you use something from the outside to crank the microtome. And this is a slightly higher magnification where you can see that what's in here is basically a sample that's held on a, a little planchette over here and a knife that's over here. And so it's basically the same sort of thing that one did with paraffin sections or with other kinds of sections, except that what you get is frozen. Now, freezing a frozen section means you then have this little piece of ice that you're stuck with at the end. And so it comes off like either it curls up or it folds up and rolls a bit. Sometimes if you're lucky, they spread out like this on the knife blade as they're cut, remembering that the sample is frozen and the entire apparatus is frozen, is maintained essentially at the same temperature. So that if you look at a, a slightly lower magnification, here's the sample and here is the section being cut right over where the arrow is very helpfully pointing. And there's one more device that you don't see very easily. There's a handle on it over here. And this handle extends to what is actually a piece of plastic that sits like this. And it's, if I now draw a little, sort of try to draw a diagram of this thing, um, Let's say this is the knife edge. And here is the block coming down. And here is the section that's being cut. So it comes off here and goes this way. Okay. In the absence of anything else, this section would curl up as you see it in this picture here, or even in this picture here. And what's here instead then is this piece of plastic that actually is supported just over the section like this. And the section goes between the knife blade and this piece of plastic. The plastic is referred to as an anti-roll bar. And the whole point of it is that it provides a kind of a static electricity barrier or a charge, if you will, that keeps the section in sort of unfolded and straight within that area. So what happens once you get a section? What do you do with it? Well, uh, let me go back and make us a, a little microscope slide. 
You basically take the frozen material, put it onto a cold microscope slide, and then take that slide and warm it up. And as you do, the section melts, and you hope that what's happened is it leaves the tissue pretty much intact as it dries onto the slide. So in true operation, this is a very rapid procedure. That is, you can take a sample, a piece of tissue, freeze it very quickly, put it on the microtome like this, cut sections, and have it on the slide within a, a half an hour to look at. So if you're interested, if, you're, if you happen to be doing pathology and you want samples that come out of the piece of tissue that the surgeon just removed and you want to know what sort of damage is in it, a cryostat turns out to be a very quick way to then study. There are issues. There's no question there are problems in dealing with frozen materials like that. It starts out from the very beginning. When you freeze tissue, of course, you have to worry about the formation of ice crystals. And the ice crystals will grow within the tissue as it freezes, and they will tear the tissue apart. So very often one treats tissue with some sort of antifreeze beforehand. Glycerol is a standard thing to use. And sometimes you fix the tissue as well. So all of this embedding process takes a little bit longer than it would if you just slapped it into the machine. On the other hand, your morphology is a lot better. And so you'll see a little of that taking place in both cases. So this is a pretty, pretty successful technique. People use it all the time when they want to look at uh, immunological samples using antibodies. And when we finally get to fluorescence and immunofluorescence, we'll review some of that. So for light microscopy, this sort of thing is, is really very, very useful. But the question then is, can one do something like this for the electron microscope? And initially, in fact, people like uh, Keith Porter and George Pilati tried to do this, to look at frozen sections of material, but it was pretty hard. And part of the problem was that the frozen sections themselves would melt in the electron beam and your tissue would just fall apart and you really couldn't see much in the way of detail. And you couldn't get sections really that were very thin with the techniques they had available then. At the same time, when you start working with frozen material, then you have to worry about condensation from the atmosphere. So all of these things became obstacles to, the look, to examining frozen material with the uh, electron microscope. But then these two people, it started actually with some thinking from Russell Steer. And Steer was interesting in that he was in some ways off the mainstream. He, was, he had a position at the US lab in one of the US agricultural labs in Baltimore, I think but had become very interested in microscopy and in freezing techniques. His basic background had to do with botany. And he started to think about what would be the way that you might be able to look at frozen material with the microscope. And so what he came up with was this very interesting idea that supposing you freeze your sample and you put your frozen sample into a vacuum. So you have a vacuum device like this. And in some way, you put your sample in the vacuum, pump it out, and then break it somehow, crack it open or cut sections, depending on what, what you wanted to do. And so you would end up then with say a piece like this and another separate piece here. 
Steer's original work was actually done with fracture, with breaking the tissue open. And so then he has these exposed surfaces. So what can you do with an exposed surface? You can't put that into an electron microscope again because it's still got the rest of the tissue underneath. But what he was able to do, what he realized you could do, was to take this thing and put an evaporating electrode, maybe a pair of them, one that would evaporate, as we discussed earlier, for shadowing platinum, and another one that would evaporate carbon to make a film of carbon. And so the idea is you'd first evaporate platinum. Now let me make this surface a little larger. And so you'd evaporate platinum onto your sample. And so you'd have this thin coating of platinum on the surface like this. And then you'd evaporate carbon on top of it because the carbon would form a kind of a coherent film. So then you'd, you'd take a piece of film and, and put it over here. And then you would take this whole business which is done under vacuum and at low temperature. You're still doing this at low temperature and take the whole thing out. And you now have a piece of tissue with a platinum and carbon replica. And you put it on something strong like an acid. Right, right, sulfuric acid, or in fact, in a lot of these original things, they used the sort of cleaning solution that was used for, uh, for glassware, which we don't see in the labs much more, but it was a potassium dichromate in uh, sulfuric acid, really vicious stuff. But anyway, what you would do is then you'd be dissolving the tissue part, So you would no longer have tissue and what you would have left would be simply the replica floating on liquid with the carbon film to hold it together. And you would put this entire thing onto a microscope grid, onto an electron microscope grid and look at what you had wrought, okay? That was the design that Russell Steer came up with. Well, this was sometimes in the late 50s, actually. At the same time, there was a lab at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich that was run by actually a man by the name Frey Wiesling, whom you won't, whose name you won't see except as an author on their paper. Frey Wissling was uh, a botanist who was very interested in plant morphology. And he had assembled this group of people to work on this subject. Hans Moore was an engineer as well. And he figured out that it would be better not to use this kind of cracking idea that Steer had done, but to actually develop a microtome like a cryostat inside the vacuum system. And so this is what he ended up making. It looks like this. Here's the vacuum system with an enclosed chamber. Okay, so we can't, we can't quite see what's inside the chamber, except to notice that there's a microscope, sort of a long distance, like a stereo microscope there. And this is what he's got inside, this incredible amount of stuff. The, most of what you see beneath this hashed area is the vacuum system. But above it is this fairly complicated mechanical system. Um, the paper, which I'll post for you, lists all of these parts and part numbers. And it, it's 50 or 60 separate parts that are in there. But basically what's in here 
is a sample place somewhere over here. A microtome that cuts sections or cuts across the sample, the binoculars for looking at it, and electrodes for evaporating the uh, film, plastic film. Now, originally, I think Moore didn't even realize, didn't believe that he was going to be able to make replicas. I think his original idea was to try to cut thin, thin frozen sections and transfer them from this apparatus to, the, to a microscope, where the idea was if they're cold and under vacuum, then you won't have condensation on top of the tissue. And so the sections can be somewhat easier to work with. As it turns out, those sections don't work. And what was necessary to was to take this frozen surface that he was generating by shearing across the sample with the knife and then making a replica of that surface. So ultimately it's more or less the same thing that Steer had done, except with a much more sophisticated system. And so here's a diagram now of the idea of a knife that you can sort of make out, right? Going across a piece of tissue. And what they realized immediately was that what happens as you break through this tissue is that the fracture doesn't just sort of go like a smooth cut across the tissue, but it travels in weak areas within the tissue itself. So you get this uneven sort of fracture plane, which you can see over here. So it sort of goes, well, in this case, the plane is supposed to go this way and then over a nucleus and through the cytoplasm and then back over through another nucleus. But it turns out that it's now actually much more elaborate than that. If you have a structure that has, well, here's the, the final replica, you might say, but down here in C is the tissue that gave rise to it. And so I think the idea is that this is a nuclear membrane, okay? And so the fracture plane goes through there, it goes over the membrane, breaks through it here and there, then it goes through something else in the tissue, and then it breaks further and goes over here. So that what you see is this complex three-dimensional, almost three-dimensional replica of that frozen surface. Here are some examples of one of Moore's earliest papers. And so these are examples of what you see. These are yeast. You, he was very careful to use antifreeze, glycerol, other materials to ensure that the freezing was minimized. And he also froze the sample in very small volumes so that he ended up being able to cut across like this and show you, at least in this case, that it sort of follows and pops out some kind of vesicle here, maybe a nucleus, and then also cuts through the structure here. So my guess is this is really the nucleus that I'm drawing now, and this is some kind of inclusion vesicle. And he shows that you can, depending on where the fracture occurs, you can look at, in this case, the formation of a bud in a budding yeast. And here he saw some very interesting unexpected structures as well on the yeast. To me, they look like bacteria, but he just calls them little rod-like structures. But then he kept, kept going. And in other samples, he was able to show, look here, this is maybe a little harder to see, He's actually going through that nuclear membrane the way we saw it in this image, okay? But now it's enlarged. And so here we see the nuclear membrane 
And if you have, remember, a microscopist's image, uh, imagination, you might be able to say, maybe I'm seeing some nuclear pores here. Well, much easier to see in this image. Right? So it looks like a pore here. But what was so dramatic in these early images was the way you could see in the surface of the nucleus or what appeared to be some structure, some surface type structure of the nucleus, you could see these clusters of what were obviously nuclear pores. And this was to people like me when this first emerged, this was truly mind blowing to suddenly get a three dimensional impression of what the surface of the nucleus looked like. Because all I was used to were thin sectioned images that looked sort of like this. Here's the nuclear membrane, like that. And this structure here was the pore. Well, I never, you know, it takes quite an imagination to go from that structure to this kind of visualization. So that's one of the things that arose from this study. These are just to show you that he tried to carry this out even further. Here's an image of some uh, mitochondria. And you can sort of make out the cristae in there. In a case like this image, you're actually pretty much on the surface on the membrane. But here you've actually cut through the tissue. So it's a, it's a very, um, it was a very revealing technique just in terms of perspective. What were we looking at? You know, what, what, how do we look at our tissues in, in that sort of way? But the question that started to emerge was, wait a minute, what are we really looking at when we see these surfaces? What part of cellular structure are we seeing? Remember, this was all in the 1960s, late 1960s. There was not a comprehensive view of what membrane structure actually was. There, was, there were debates. You may recall that the work of Fry and Edited that showed the movement of materials in the membrane that came out in um, somewhere around 1965. So there was a ferment of what is structure, what are we seeing in membranes, okay? And two things came out of the, the study here. One of them was this very interesting study by Branton, which is the one that's lower down in here, in which he actually took two lipid layers. So there's one layer here and another layer here and set things up so that they were, well, he started by dipping a slide and then taking the slide out and eventually creating what he saw would be a, mon a pair of monolayers. You see, there's a monolayer here. Let's see if I can draw this right. There's a monolayer here with ice attached to it, is what he says, because there's water there. And the other side of this monolayer is here, separated by a piece of glass. Or no, I'm sorry, saying mounted in such a way that they were on a piece of glass so that when you broke it, the idea was you would break one side of this hopefully bilayer and this on the other side, okay? And put them into separate devices to measure what he did with them was he put radioactive C14 on them. So he says, one of these will be C14, one of these will be not C14. If I split it after I've frozen the membrane, will all the C14 be on one slide 
or will it have already been mixed together so that here's, here's the way we can think about this experiment. One of the possibilities is that um, here's the C14 layer and here's the unlabeled layer, okay? Now I can split it and imagine several kinds of split. Let's try this one. One of the possibilities would be to split it so that in fact, they split down the middle, which is what I would have, what we now would predict, right? That you have this one plus this one. But an alternative is that they split between, remember there was some sort of water on this side. So that maybe they would split where the water is. And then you would end up with something that looks like this. You'd have this piece plus this piece on one side, and you'd have the water on the other side. In other words, you would have all the radioactivity together on one side, even if it had started on the other one. So this was an argument that you were actually splitting the membrane in the middle. What he then added to that observation was that if you waited a certain amount of time, you actually did get some crosstalk some exchange of radioactivity from one side to the other. And that's what this graph suggests, that within an hour, maybe two hours, within an hour, you're really getting some mixing of the label from the two sides of that experiment, okay? So that conclusion came through, that the membrane might very well be splitting in the middle. But another option, another opportunity arose to think about this even more. And that was that if you freeze your tissue, now I'm gonna go back to, where'd it go? I'm gonna go back to this diagram here. When you freeze it and fracture it, if you break in the membrane, then you might very well be seeing, because this part of the membrane is all underneath the ice, you might just see this frozen face, this fractured face, and then you would go across here, okay? And what was realized though is that your sample, if your sample was sitting in a vacuum, a high vacuum, and had been prepared properly, once you broke the sample open, you cut a slice of it, you could keep the vacuum on for a lot longer and suck out additional water that might be in the sample. And so what they're suggesting here, and it's, it's a little hard to see in this area, would be right here. Let me draw it a little bigger. If you started with a, a membrane, so here's a membrane and you, it curves and you broke here so that what you would end up seeing would be this, this middle portion. Here's a suggestion of the middle portion. And that's what you would see if the break just simply revealed that middle portion, okay? But if I now expose this thing to a vacuum, so now the idea is supposing I can etch away some of this material over here. Remember that the idea is that what I had in here when it broke was that there was water in this area. So this broke, 
Now what I do is I remove some of this water. So remember you cut across this way. But now if you allow the water to evaporate, you can now see this surface, which is the true membrane surface, plus the split surface. That was the idea. And that was the experiment that Branton also did, the same Branton. And let me show you the result of that experiment. He played it in a very interesting way. What he did was he said, let's take a red cell and do a freeze fracture of a red cell. And when I do, I see, okay, I see these clusters of particles on the membrane. Later on, I mean, it became clear later on, these were transmembrane proteins. But we saw these particles were they really inside the membrane or were they outside the membrane? Okay. So what he did was he took the membranes of red cells and incubated them with a molecule called ferritin. And ferritin is a complex heme protein, pretty large. Because it has iron in it, you can actually see it in the electron microscope as a little dot. And that's what you see here. That's the ferritin. And the ferritin is on the membranes on the outside, but clearly not on the inside of that membrane. So, so if this is our sort of bilayer membrane, the ferritin would be only in lumps around the outside. On the other hand, we also know, well, we now know, but we can guess that there are these smaller particles within, right? So here's what he does. He takes membrane like this or whole red cells and fractures them, does a freeze fracture experiment. So right here, we're again looking at this equivalent, that is the interior of the membrane. But right over here is the edge of where the liquid was that's now been evaporated down. So this portion of the membrane is now exposed. And you can, so he can, see these molecules here on the outside surface of the membrane, what is the true outside surface of the membrane. And you can tell because they have an F label for ferritin. Well, he put that on afterwards. But its ferritin is now visualized if he didn't have ferritin present and he carried out this experiment, what he would see was just a very smooth membrane surface here if he etched in that same way. So now what's happened is, among other things, this process, which was originally called by Moore freeze etching, now became known as freeze fracture. Followed by etching as an option. So sometimes you would fracture without, option, without etching. Sometimes you would deliberately do the etching by leaving your sample in there longer. So let me show you just a couple more images of the sort of power that this stuff brought to analysis. This is where you have to indulge me, but this is from a paper I did a number of years ago. And unfortunately, the reproductions are, are kind of crummy. But this was, these are images of the edge of a cell. These are microvilli, basically, at the edge of a, of a cell actually in a tumor, but it's not too critical. Okay, so we're looking at these microvilli distributed in this tissue like that. 
And what you see here are profiles in which you can see, for instance, over here, you can see these intramembrane particles because we've split that membrane across the top. And over here, you can see the opposite surface in which, interestingly enough, there aren't as many particles. So if we look at this thing again in a, as a membrane, what we're suggesting is that in this particular membrane, those intramembrane particles stay associated with one surface and not with the other. And this was known for a number, number of examples, okay? So that's one way of looking at these microvilli, again, to get an interesting perspective. But it turns out these microvilli are actually, some of them, producing virus. And this is a virus that causes cancer, breast cancer in mice. And in a detailed image of one of these microvilli, you see something rather surprising. The membrane is continuous. The surface is continuous all the way through this microvillus. And we're looking again at the intramembrane particles. <clears throat> In the area where the virus itself is being released, so what this would look like in the thin section would be something like this. Where right over here, you have a lot of spikes because this is a spiked virus. And it has a special nuclear structure. And what's interesting is it, ex it excludes a certain component of the membrane of the microvillus. So that as the virus is assembled in the, mic in the microvillus, it actually changes the membrane content from the normal cellular membrane content to something more characteristic of the virus. So that was one example for fun. Here's another one. This is a couple of cells from uh, an embryonic chick retina. Also, I'm afraid my work. But what's interesting in this cell structure, in this freeze fracture, is this structure here. And we can see another example of it here. And those are gap junctions. Those are gap junctions between this cell, say, and the one towards us that we can't see, the one above it. And so if, if we were to do a section through here and look at it from the side, what we would be seeing is a piece of one cell over here and a piece of the other cell over here with the gap junction, as we're used to it with little particles going straight across. And now you can visualize it here in that kind of micrograph. One more example of how this stuff has worked. A man by the name of uh, Heuser, whose work, whose paper, um, posting for you, who did a terrific review, and I'll talk about that review once I show you his pictures. He discovered that under the right circumstances, you can deep etch a cell. So here's what he did. He has a cell, again, fractures through it, and then etches Instead of just etching a little bit, so that you just get sort of this edge of a membrane, he etches away all the water all the way down to the very membrane of membrane surface of that cell. So that now what he's looking at is this surface, which has some interesting depressions or pits on it, if you will. And these are clathrin-coated vesicles, okay? And so he's able to see and demonstrate these clathrin-coated vesicles more or less as they're coming into the cell. And he also shows you 
that there's an array like this of clathrin related material on the surface that hasn't been brought into these vesicular structures. So this is a very, this, this work has made it into every textbook as I think you're aware. And what Heuser has done is he's written a review. This was a review from 2011 in which he goes through quite a bit of the work that he's done in the past. And he's invested a lot of his effort into doing 3D imaging. But these are sort of standard stereo images with red and green glasses. If you can, ident can locate a pair of red and green glasses to look at, to look at these, these images that are in this paper, which I, I'll post for you, they're extraordinarily interesting. The, the depth that he shows is remarkable. And you really get a sense, once again, of moving through not even the sort of the original ideas was you get some basic idea of contour. In these things, you can really imagine that you're walking around inside the cell, looking at maybe if you were the fluid component moving around in that surface. Okay, so that's definitely recommended if you can find yourself a pair of uh, red green glasses somewhere to see some stereo images it's really worth seeing the rest of the paper nevertheless is pretty remarkable so i recommend it very highly so uh, this paper is sort of the first in which we're slightly entering the 21st century but he's really talking mostly about work that went on during the 20th century, going back as far as the mid 1950s. Okay, so I can stop here. What I'm going to do in the next lecture is go through a discussion about Zernica and the development of phase contrast. And if we can fit it all in something on uh, differential interference contrast.